All right, hi everybody. Um, today we are going to talk about electronegativity. We're gonna talk about the last 10 slides on the PowerPoint presentation that starts with um, the Lewis dot structures. Um, so we'll go ahead and talk about electronegativity. If you happen to have your electronegativity table, if I hand it out to you in class, it's a good idea to have that handy. That's not the same as a periodic table. I usually copy them and make them blue so they look different for you. If you don't have a copy on the next slide here, linked on the next slide is the this paper copy. Um, and so you would have a digital copy, not paper. Anyway, um, you could open up a tab so that you could reference that. Okay, so what is electronegativity? Electronegativity is a measure of the tendency of an atom to attract a bonding pair of electrons. I like to think of it as how strong an atom is and how much it's going to pull the electrons toward it and away from another atom. So we're gonna do really, really simple math. We're gonna do some subtraction in order to calculate um, whether bonds are polar covalent, nonpolar covalent, or ionic. So it says here, if the electronegativity values of two atoms involved in a bond, so you need to look at this table. If I pull it up really close, do you see like, Let's look at chromium for just a second. So chromium has an atomic number of 24, and that's how many protons it has. But then right here, it's got its electronegativity value, and it's hard for me to read it, but I think it says 1.56. Um, so you're going to find two of those atoms um, and what their electronegativity numbers are, and then you subtract them. And when you subtract them, that gives you, that difference is going to tell you whether their bond, when they make a bond, whether it would be polar covalent, nonpolar covalent, or ionic. So if the differences between the two are the same, so if, it, if you subtract and it adds up to, or subtracts, the difference is zero, then we say that that's a covalent bond. There's no difference. So if you look on this table and one of them is 2.2 and the other one is 2.2, then we say that they would have a covalent bond. They share those electrons equally. They're both, both of the atoms are equally as strong. However, if one of the atoms is quite a bit stronger or electronegative than the other atom, then they're not going to share the electrons evenly, kind of like a kindergartner who's not very good at sharing their toys and is kind of a bully and maybe has the toys more than half the time. And the other kids are like, ah, I want the toys. Okay, that's an electronegative kindergartner. Um, so if there's a slight difference between the two atoms, then we say that that's a polar covalent bond. If there's a huge difference between the two, then the, the really strong electronegative atom is actually going to fully take the electron. There's no sharing anymore. And the other atom loses an electron. That's what an ionic bond is. One receives an electron or electrons and one um, loses electrons. So that's an ionic bond. So then there's kind of these subtle differences between what the different types of covalent bonds are. So what I would like you to do on your regular gold periodic table, not on this blue periodic table, because, well, I may or may not let you use this on the test. I'm not sure. But you should make this number line, and let me get my ugly mug out of the way here. There we go. You should write this number line on one of your tables that you could use um, on the test. So for example, I made my number line right up here on this one. I was using this piece of paper. And so all you need to write, you don't need to draw the diagrams or have lots of words or anything, but just from the section that goes zero to 0.4, any time that the difference between two atoms' electronegativities is zero to 0.4, less than 0.4, we say that that's a regular covalent bond, that they're sharing the electrons equally, and we say that's nonpolar. If the difference between the two atoms, um, their electronegativities, is between 0.4 and 1.7, then we say that's a polar covalent bond. And so some are really strongly polar covalent and some are mildly polar covalent, depending on where they fall on this continuum. Once you get over 1.7, then we say, well, that's really an ionic bond. One of the atoms has actually taken the electrons away. And again, there's a huge difference on that. So you could be extremely, extremely ionic or you could be Eh, kind of ionic, and so we're going to call you ionic, but you're not super ionic. Um, yeah, that's really technical. So down at the bottom, oops, I got to clear something that's in my way here. It says an ionic compound is defined as one that can transfer an electric charge. This is an exception to the rule that I'm about to tell you. Sometimes calculating electronegativity differences can be mislead, give misleading information. If a substance can transfer an electric charge, it is ionic even if the differences indicate that it should be a covalent compound. So this 
does not trump the reality of being able to um, contain or to, um, transfer an electric charge. If it can transfer an electric charge, then it's ionic. It's not, don't worry about the electronegativities. That's just an FYI. All right, moving on. Oops, I got to click here. Sorry, I'm trying to click and it's not moving. There we go. Let's get my ugly mug out of the way again. There we go. All right, comparing electronegativity differences. So use your table. Um, it's linked right there um, to determine the difference in electron attraction between two atoms. I really want you to take a look at this super simple diagram because I think it shows it really well. So when we have um, a covalent bond. The two atoms are sharing those electrons evenly. Notice that the electrons are, are halfway in between the two atoms. When one is, when the bond is polar, when one is somewhat more electronegative, it's pulling the electrons closer. Electrons are negatively charged. So if it has the electrons more often um, or a greater amount than the other one does, that that atom is going to start developing a slightly negative attitude, a slightly negative charge. And the other atom that's losing its electrons, so I'm going backwards from the diagram, but anyway, the pink one is doesn't have the electrons as much. And so it overall has a slightly positive charge because it's losing some of these electrons some of the time. It's not sharing it 50-50. In a fully ionic compound, then in the diagram, oh, I can point me to it, the diagram right there, there we go. Um, the green atom has actually taken the electrons and the yellow atom has lost the electrons. That's fully uh, electron or fully ionic. So ionic, remember, is between a metal and a non-metal, so the opposite sides of the periodic table, and the electronegativity difference is greater than 1.7. So on your, your number line here, it's 1.7 to 4. That's an ionic compound. For polar covalent, it's going to be two nonmetals. So covalent is usually two nonmetals. And the electronegativity difference is going to be in that middle range between 0.4 and 1.7. A fully covalent nonpolar, um, their sharing equally, is going to have between 0 and 0.4 for its electronegativity difference. So we're saying in that case, they're sharing it equally. All right, so water has some really, 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 really important properties. And we're gonna learn about water in our very first unit in AP Biology when we do biochemistry. So I'll just touch on some of these super crazy important um, properties of water right now. Water is covalent, but it is special in so many life-giving ways. It's actually polar covalent. We'll get to that in just a second. So why is water a liquid instead of a gas? It's made of hydrogen and oxygen. Why is it a liquid? Hydrogen and oxygen are gases. Why is it a liquid? Why does water have really strong surface tension? Why can little spiders like walk across the water? Why, why is that possible? Why does ice float? Solids should sink in their liquids, but ice floats. What is it about water that allows, and that's a life-giving property on this planet. Oh my gosh, that is so incredibly important. Why does water have high, such high specific heat? In other words, why does it take so much energy to warm up the ocean or vice versa? So much energy, the loss of so much energy to cool down the ocean. Why does it take so long for the ocean to change temperature? Again, a life-giving property on this planet um, based on um, some of the properties of water. And then how can water climb within a tree that has no heart? So have you ever thought about that? Especially like these giant sequoias that are like as tall as a super sky, super, what am I trying to say? Super tall building. Um, how does water get from its roots all the way up? There's no heart. There's no pump. Water is super heavy. How's it getting up there? That's magic. We're going to learn about that. What makes water so special? So for one, water is in fact what we call polar covalent and not just covalent. We'll get to that. So if you look at, and you need to know a lot about water, just to be clear. So water is H2O. So the red atom here is an oxygen. And then the two hydrogens are, um, the, two hydrogens are the white um, atoms below it. Um, oxygen is typically a bully. It is a very strongly electronegative atom. So it has a tendency to pull the electrons close to it because, and you can see that in the diagram, because electrons have a negative charge that makes the oxygen a little bit negative. Now remember, covalent molecules aren't about taking and losing electrons. That's ionic molecules. We're supposed to be sharing here only the oxygen isn't sharing 50-50. The oxygen's kind of hogging those electrons a little bit, and the hydrogens are like, ah, you're taking our electrons. 
So the, that makes the oxygen slightly negative and it makes each of the hydrogens slightly positive. If you take a look and do the math um, from your electronegativity table, you can see that the electronegativity of oxygen is 3.5 and of hydrogen is 2.2. So the difference is 1.3. And that falls in the actually quite high end of the polar covalent bonds. Um, and a quick aside, these tables you might find on the internet have slightly different numbers. Every table I've ever seen, the numbers are slightly different. So let's just stick to the one that I give you and then we're all playing with the same numbers. I hope the, I hope the numbers I used on that slide were from that one. I hope so. So water isn't just covalent, water is polar covalent. A polar covalent bond, the electrons are shared unevenly and the structure of the molecule allows for a positive side and a negative side. So here's the negative side of um, the water molecule and these two over here, my mug is in the way again, are the positive side of the molecule. Partial charges are um, in a polar covalent molecule. The sides of the molecule have charges and we designate those with the lowercase delta. So a capital delta is a triangle, but the lowercase delta is this swoopy thing. Um, so delta plus and delta minus. So here's the picture right there. Or here's the image right there. This is the delta minus. That's the partial negative charge. And that's a partial positive charge. What it means is the oxygen doesn't get a full minus. That would mean it actually collected an electron. It gets a partial minus because it's hogging the electrons a little bit more than 50% of the time. So that gives it a partial negative charge. And each of the hydrogens have a partial positive charge because they don't have the um, electrons all of the time. All right, so this I think is arguably the most complicated page of what we're gonna be doing. So it says using your electronegativity values, this table to determine, use your electronegativity values to determine if these bonds are ionic, polar covalent or non-polar covalent. Then determine if the whole molecule is polar or not. And that's determined by symmetry. I haven't taught you that. So let's just look at the bonds first. So let's look at carbon and oxygen. The very first one that says carbon and oxygen. I'm going to look it up. So carbon is a 2.5 and oxygen is a 3.5. So if I subtract 3.5 minus 2.5 on my number line, the difference between the two of them is a 1. And 1 falls right in the middle of polar. So I know that the carbon-oxygen bond is polar. Um, if I go to the next one, the here, I'm going to point, try to point at it. Nope, I can't do it. It's too awkward for me. That one over there. There we go. Um, the um, one with the nitrogen and the three hydrogens, ammonia. Um, let's look at the nitrogen and hydrogen um, electronegativity difference. So nitrogen is 3.07 and hydrogen is 2.2. So if I subtract the two of them, let me just do it really quick, 3.7 minus 2.2, why can I not do that in my head, is a 1.5. Did I say it right? 3.07? No, 3.07. I think I did that wrong. Who cares? Does it really matter, KJ? Why are you doing the math on this? I don't know. Okay, the answer is 0.87. So again, that's falling in this section here that's the polar bonds. So the nitrogen-hydrogen bonds are polar. And then I can do the same thing with um, carbon and fluorine. I can look up carbon. Carbon on this is a 2.5. Fluorine is a really high one. It's 4.1. In fact, I think fluorine is the highest one on all of them. Um, so the subtraction indicates that that one is really, 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 really um, a bigger difference than the other ones have been. So then, so that's just the bonds. So now let's look at the molecule itself and let's determine if the molecule is polar or nonpolar. And this becomes a little bit more complicated. So it says, is a mole molecule polar? Look at the 3D symmetry. And this is why we've been doing the Vesper models and why we've been building the models. If the model is symmetrical, if the molecule is symmetrical, um, completely symmetrical, now this is confusing, um, then no matter what the bonds are, the molecule is nonpolar. However, if the molecule is asymmetrical, um, bent and trigonal pyramidal are always asymmetrical, um, then we're going to look at the electronegativity difference to determine whether it's polar or nonpolar. So, so trying to think where I want to go with this next. So 
over on the um, on the side, uh, it says um, next to the carbon, the carbon with the four chlorines, carbon tetrafluoride. Um, it says it is symmetrical. So all these carbons are pulling against the fluorines, and it's symmetrical. Even though carbon and fluorine have a difference, it's 2.5 and 4.1. So I'm going to do the math on that. 4.1 minus 2.5. So they have an electronegativity difference, super strong. It's 1.6. So that's way up at the top of the polar. But in this case, all of the fluorines are pulling equally because the molecule is symmetrical. And so that actually cancels out the polarity and makes it a nonpolar molecule. What? Let's read this thing down below and get my mug out of the way. It says the symmetric shape and the fact that the polarities of the bonds are exactly the same means that the polarities of the bonds cancel each other out, leaving the molecule as a whole nonpolar. Many molecules are nonpolar but have polar bonds. Um, I could show you really quickly, I don't know if it's worth it, this little website. Let me pop out of here for a second. If you want to know more information, this is linked on my PowerPoint, um, and it just tells you a little bit of information. When are tetrahedral molecules polar and when are they nonpolar? So here's an example of a tetrahedral molecule, CH4, it's methane. Um, each of those bonds is polar, but because there are four hydrogens and they are all pulling on those electrons in an even way, they cancel, their, their poles cancel each other out. And so the whole molecule is considered nonpolar. So it says, um, yeah, I was trying to see if I could word it in a different way. So CH4 is symmetrically polarized inwards and thus every possible dipole moment vector cancels out and therefore CH4 is nonpolar. Now let's change this tetrahedron just a little bit. Let's take one of the hydrogens and change them to a chlorine. So one of the, it's still an AB4. That means you have a central carbon and four atoms that are bonded to it. But this time, one of the atoms is very different than the others. Look at the difference in the symmetry. This is a symmetrical molecule. This is definitely not a symmetrical molecule. And where you see red indicates high electronegativity. So that chlorine is very strong and it's pulling the electrons toward it. And now this is still a tetrahedral molecule, but it is not, I mean, it is polar. It is not symmetrical, so it is polar. Ooh, please get those words in your head. If it's symmetrical, it's nonpolar. If it's not symmetrical, it could be polar if the bonds are all polar. Let that sink in for a few minutes. Um, you can study this page on your own. I'm going to move on. So one more, whoops, let's hit present here. One more time, I word it kind of in the simplest words I can. Give it a second here on this page. So to be clear, when we're talking about polar bonds versus polar molecules, you use the table of electronegativities to determine if a single bond, just a bond, and I don't mean versus a double bond or a triple bond. I'm just talking about a bond. If it's nonpolar or polar or ionic, you use, you, oops, that was upside down. You subtract them and look at this number line, and that's how you determine if it's polar, nonpolar, or ionic. Simple. Next, you use the symmetry of the entire molecule to determine if the molecule as a whole is polar or nonpolar. So any given bond within the molecule might be polar or nonpolar. And the molecule might be different than that. So do this one more time. So lastly, oops, I'm not doing it correctly. Try that again. <laughs> um, a symmetrical molecule that contains polar bonds is nonpolar. One more time. A symmetrical molecule that contains polar bonds is nonpolar because it's symmetrical. As soon as you make it non-symmetrical or asymmetrical, then it becomes polar. What? Okay, let that sink in. Let me know if you're having troubles with it.
All right. And then this, we don't need to spend any time on this, but this just shows you electron density maps and kind of what some molecules look like. Um, so the red is where it's especially um, negative, where it has a partial negative charge. The blue is where it has a partial positive charge. And so you can see, for example, that these hydrogens, the green, the two hydrogens, um, that that is nonpolar, that it doesn't have a polar side. Whereas this one, the lithium and the hydrogen is strongly polar. The hydrogen is much more electronegative than the um, lithium is. So the electrons are being pulled toward that hydrogen um, more than they're being pulled to the lithium. All right, moving on. Last section here, how solutes dissolve in water. So remember a solute versus a solution or a solvent. Um, a solute is what you're dissolving. So like if you have, if you're making lemonade, um, the solute is the sugar. If you're making uh, in the ocean salt water, the salt is the solute. Okay, one more time. How solutes dissolve in water, which is polar covalent, water is polar covalent, remember, differs by the nature of the solute bonds. So the way that sugar is dissolved in water is very, very different than the way that salt is dissolved in water. And sugar and salt are completely different. Sugar is a covalent molecule. Salt is an ionic molecule, um, ionic compound, better word for it than molecule. So mug always in the way. When sugar, which is a covalent molecule, is added to water, the sugar molecule stays together. And then the water molecules kind of go all around it, but you still have this blob of sugar and water molecules surround it. When salt, which is an ionic compound, is added to water, it dissociates, it breaks up. So in this diagram here, you can see the sugars are all still together. But in this case, the salt and the chlorine, I mean, sorry, the sodium and the chlorine separated from each other. So we call that dissociation when it breaks up into its component parts. And I'll practice that word with you again in just a second. So what's really happening when water dissolves an ionic compound? This is the last slide, by the way, everybody. So take a look at the diagram because I think it's super helpful. That is a crystal of salt that you're starting with. And you can see how the positively charged sodiums sit close to the negatively charged um, chlorines and they line up in rows and it's very, you know, very organized. So then when you dissolve it in water, water, which is slightly um, one, it's polar. So one side of the water is slightly positive and one side of the water is slightly negative. They come near the um, different ions of the salt and pull them away. So look carefully at the diagram. Look at the oxygens, which are red, and notice that they have a slight negative charge. They surround a sodium ion because it's slightly positive. However, look at the next diagram over. The waters flip around the other direction, and now the hydrogens, which have slight positive charges, are going to sit really close to the chlorine ions, which are negative. And we, in essence, pick away at the salt molecule until it's been completely pulled apart. So the way that it dissolves is very different. So dissociation is the, the word that means the process of ionic bonds being split when dissolved in water. An electrolyte, which is what salt water is, and there are many electrolytes, an electrolyte is a chemical that dissociates into cations and anions. Remember, cations are positive and anions are negative in water. A strong electrolyte completely dissociates. Salt water is a strong elect electrolyte. A weak electrolyte only partially dissociates. So what that means is that some of them separate the way we see here, and some of them don't. Some of them stay together. Um, and we're going to learn more about strong and weak electrolytes in an upcoming unit. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. Let me know if you have any questions.